Welcome to Elevating Consciousness, the podcast that helps you discover deeper levels of truth, meaning, and wholeness. I'm your host, Artem Zen, and our guest today is an award-winning author, meditation teacher, psychotherapist, and founder of the Effortless Mindfulness Institute. His teachings synthesize the best of ancient wisdom practices, neuroscience, and contemporary psychology. Using an all-inclusive style of dialogue and inquiry, he helps people cut through suffering and awaken to their true nature. He's been sharing his teachings in retreats and workshops internationally for over 25 years and is the author of Shift Into Freedom and The Way of Effortless Mindfulness. Lock Kelly, welcome to the show. Thank you, Artem. Great to be here with you and great to be with your listeners. Yeah, great to have you here. And, um, you know, I want to just set a little bit of context before we dive in. Um, there's a lot of meditation and mindfulness teachers out there, but I think there are few whose teachings and pointings are as clear and as effective as yours, especially for people who can't dedicate a lot of time for long retreats. I think you mentioned in one of your books that the practice of Sutra Mahamudra was so well suited for the layperson that you called it Brooklyn Mahamudra. That's right. And and I'm from Brooklyn, New York myself. Uh -huh. And um you know, as much as a part of me would like to be a monastic, I'm a householder with two kids. So that really speaks to me. And I have this kind of vision slash saying of Brooklyn enlightened. Mm. And it's it's this idea that if you can become enlightened here, you can become enlightened anywhere. The, that's the song from Frank Sinatra, right? Yeah, yeah. If you can make it in you, if you can make it here, you can make it anywhere. And I, I flip it around. If you could if you could become enlightened here, you could become enlightened anywhere. You know, and it's it's this kind of notion of working with people who have the like biggest and messiest egos and, and helping them realize what they are beyond that. And, you know, you spent many years working in a mental health clinic in, in Brooklyn. And I actually do culture and leadership development at a psychotherapy startup in Brooklyn right now. So there's also that little overlap there. Um, but maybe we can start by uh, sharing some of the pivotal moments on your path and how you came to develop, synthesize, effortless mindfulness, aka Brooklyn Mahamudra. Sure, yeah. Yeah, and I'll kind of start almost there in, in the middle, um, and then I can kind of go back if needed. But uh, <clears throat> I, I had some early experiences, and I find that when I really ask people uh, who come and are interested, if you ask them, have you had some peak experiences? Have you had uh, this sense of shifting out of your small self into this more spacious and pervasive, interconnected, heartfelt uh, way of being that doesn't feel like a state or just an emotional condition, but is actually truly who we are and who you feel, you feel real and you feel whole and you feel that you also have capacity to deal with um, any parts of you, any trauma, any emotions, and any difficult situations in a responsive way, most people will say, oh, yeah, I guess I, guess I have. I wouldn't think of that as awakening or enlightenment or what we're after. But uh, <clears throat> so I had some experiences early on, um, and then that led me to be curious to say, where, you know, if this is real, and if this is true, and if this is kind of the the wisdom of ancient times that is available to us now, at that time, uh, travel and teaching and books were becoming translated and available. So uh, I went off on a graduate school study, and I was doing... Uh, work with uh, psychology and spirituality at Columbia and went off to Sri Lanka, India, and Nepal. And that's where I sat in more traditional meditation at first. Most people kind of insight meditation, yoga, um, and then traveled up to eventually go to Nepal, where I met uh, a Tibetan teacher who at that time was giving out all these kind of direct uh, pointers uh, direct approach teachings, um, and his name was Toko Ergen Rinpoche, and he um, he had gone through three three year retreats, which were very traditional long retreats, 
And when he he realized at the end of that third re retreat that when he was 16, his uncle had given him this short pointing out instruction and that it was no different after the three three-year retreats than it was when he was 16. So he started to say, well, I might as well give it to people who show up because these retreats and maybe not everyone knows them. So that's where I met this Mahmudra style, uh, which is very direct. And it's not that it's instant enlightenment like instant coffee. It's really based on the premise that the awakening, the freedom, the love, the uh, sense of uh, connection and wholeness is already here within each of us and really as each of us, so that there's a way to learn how to shift or drop or let go or open and include everything from here, not just to escape or do a spiritual bypass, but really to open to a subtler, wider, deeper, higher dimension that then is the ground of who we are that can then be with all the internal and external uh, situations. And so at that point, I thought, wow, this is so amazing, so immediate. I don't need to stay here and join a monastery or meditate for three years in India. I'll come back to Brooklyn <laughs> and continue this joint degree with a social work degree. And so I started working in psychiatric inpatient and psych emergency room, and then eventually five years outpatient psych in a community mental health clinic and found that not only did I not need silence and uh, quiet and retreat, but that in the midst of whatever's happening, there's this ability to find an awareness that's always calm and clear and courageous. And so that, so that silence isn't the absence of sound, it's really the more primary dimension of this uh, effortless awareness. And so <clears throat> that's when I started in the midst of these breaks, um, when clients wouldn't show up or uh, I had time in between, I'd look out of this window on this Brooklyn Mental Health Clinic and start to do these practices and kind of reverse engineer some of these kind of more advanced yet simple practices and found that I was motivated to help my clients and to, to kind of try to translate these more ancient wisdom into simplest, most elegant and effective ways that people could access this, which had given me such great uh, complete change of my consciousness in into just what Zen calls ordinary mind, extraordinary, but not like, you know, an altered state, actually more of a natural condition. Yeah. So um, thanks for, for sharing, unpacking all of that. And, um, you know, what kind of stands out was your teacher doing the three year retreats. I think you said he did three of them, right? And then realizing like, oh, actually, I already like had this same insight that my, my uncle showed me. And then it seems like your journey was kind of similar. Were you able to kind of re like stabilize all these insights without actually going on long retreats? Yeah. So the, you know, the thing is, again, the unique um, approach are these small glimpses many times rather than long retreats, because it's not about creating a calm meditation state or calming the ego or getting rid of the ego or it's actually uh tuning in to an already calm clear uh flow consciousness that you're able which shifts your identity your sense of self so it isn't like i'm having an insight um it's like it's a new view so they often call these glimpse practices orientation instructions so we're just reorienting from a small 
sense of self to a subtler consciousness that also includes all of our thoughts and feelings and even what was an ego identity just becomes an ego function to this more um, relaxed, open, clear feeling of being rather than uh, worrying or solving problems or uh, scanning for danger from a small mind-body uh, self based in thought, you know, rather than being, I think, therefore I am, shifting into awareness-based knowing, and then you can move your hand, you can use thought, but you're not no longer a smart meditator trying to have insights here. You feel like the view from here, from this effortless mindfulness, is already open-hearted and wise. Yeah, so I think in my own journey, I've been kind of, I find myself in this kind of path. Um, you know, I've been working with uh, Dan Brown's lineage. <laughs> Yes. And his teachings are very similar. Like it's very also similar. Maha Mudra stuff. Yeah. And uh, Michael Taft, he's been doing, he does a lot of meditations that are kind of like this. It's, it's, it's more of this kind of easy, not having to be super concentrated, more open. But, but it's also interesting how, um, you know, now I've ran across these teachings, but it seems like there is a lot of other teachings that are more based on uh, really developing like the strong concentration, going on long retreats, sitting, noting, like being super clear about every little bit of your experience. And I'm just wondering, you know, what is it with these two different approaches? Why is that st still, it seems to be like a very popular approach, um, you know, and maybe that's kind of more like the deliberate mindfulness right. uh, thing. And I'm just wondering, like, it seems like this is the, you know, more an easier one, an easier yeah. approach, and one that would be uh, more suited for most people. But it still seems like a lot of people, at least initially, go down the deliberate mindfulness path. Yes, yeah, and uh, that's a great question because, you know, I mean, I think, um, you know, in this country and in uh, Western culture, you know, kind of the late 50s and the 60s, all of a sudden meditation started coming into the culture. And then all of a sudden there was this big yoga movement in the 60s and 70s and yoga just boomed. Uh, so people could do that. And, you know, that is, you know, coming from a culture of not have it, not focusing on consciousness or meditation, but doing more either uh, prayer or ritual if people were involved in religion or more secular, mental, uh, intelligent uh, thought, thought practices that this kind of deeper consciousness starting with the body is easier because it's like sports or uh, walking or so then you start stretching and you start doing these bottom up practices from breath, you know, calming your nervous system, and then sometimes in yoga doing five minutes at the end of meditation, you know, as kind of the last few seconds. And then uh, a bunch of the Westerners, uh, particularly Jack Kornfield, Joseph Goldstein, Sharon Salzberg, and others uh, went off to the Theravada or Insight Meditation um, countries of Burma, Thailand, and Sri Lanka, where I also went to Sri Lanka and did some of that. And so that approach within Buddhism um, emphasizes starting with one-pointed attention, watching your breath, and then moving to uh, kind of being aware of the contents of consciousness and noticing the insights that I'm not my thoughts. There's no solid small self that is me. It's actually process. And then uh, doing practices, uh, calming practices and positive thinking of loving kindness, sending it to others. 
those are pretty, you know, certainly watching your breath and loving kindness are are not so far from everyday life. As soon as you go further into consciousness, uh, it's another map. Um, and so this map that people can experience right away, but they don't know how to make sense of it. So, you know, in the Mahamudra map, the, there's this awake consciousness, there's this kind of awareness that isn't attention, that isn't from your mind focused on objects or contents of consciousness, but it is actually feels like an open field of awareness that you're not only aware of, but you're resting as, and then you're aware from, and then you actually even feel as if there's not two things between the awareness and the experience. They feel like more ocean and waves that make you feel interconnected. Uh, and there's a safety there. So that that map or it's just a little like what is that wait a minute i never i never heard about that in philosophy or psychology even um in the west where so i think i think it's newer uh, i'm trying to you know because i came from insight started with zen actually and then went to insight meditation and then and then this more direct path um you know, I use the word effortless mindfulness to try to build on uh, traditional or conventional mindfulness, um, because you can start there, and in the Tibetan system, uh, these practices of, you know, shamatha, which is watching your breath and uh, loving kindness are calm practices, so that you do start there, even in the traditional Tibetan. And then you go to insight, uh, seeing the that the solid self is not solid. But then the next moves of effortless mindfulness are added to as soon as you can calm and as soon as you have a sense of insight, you go right to, well, then if I'm not this self, what am I? You don't get left in the gap of just deconstructing and becoming no self. You begin to immediately feel with awareness a kind of safe intelligent more open awareness that most people feel when they're doing things they love when they're in in the flow or in the zone uh dancing playing music walking they drop out of their ego they feel connected to everything but they're looking out so they don't realize that it's not about high functioning only, it's not about good feelings only, but it's because that that activity is a doorway that shifts you into the already awake consciousness, which whose natural qualities are joy and even functioning. So, so not focus so much on retreating, sitting quietly, eyes closed, because that can give you initial insights, but then it's about living an awake life that is possible for um, for all of us, at least through these small glimpses, and you can start to feel how different they are. So these I, I think it's going to it's going to become. I'm trusting that I'm kind of slowly, <laughs> slowly walking this. Like, okay, da, 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 let's just keep talking about it and saying yes, that's really good, and try this and try this. If you like this, try, yeah, that's great. But if you, here's another option to go directly in the middle of your day, more uh, immediate and and more optimally functioning with eyes open. So. Hopefully that will, you know, those who who are drawn to that or it works with well will will start to. Yeah. So 
you know, what it makes me think about what you're saying is that this kind of uh, experience, I don't know if you could say it's an experience, but the true nature of who we are, it's always available and people kind of glimpse into it. They have these experiences without realizing that they're actually having them. So what do you think are the barriers? Is it that we're so used to being identified with thoughts? It's like, as soon as we have that opening, we have that moment, we don't realize that, okay, here comes another thought. Now we're identified with that thought again. And we're once again, back into the content and not noticing the context. And it seems like through this practice, you're flipping it. So you're, you're starting to pay more attention to the context within every, within which everything arises rather than what's arising. That's right. Yeah. And, and, you know, that's well said that, that it is, there's, you know, it's good to look at the contents and be, feel the uh, thoughts, feelings, sensations, emotions, and be clear about what they are, what's happening. But when you shift, then make the next move, which is not on the map of our culture. So the obstacle is that we're overly highly educated <laughs> that are even those who are doing meditation yoga for a long time don't necessarily have an easier time doing this than people who just are what i call naturals or kind of um, tends to be like good-hearted people or something or kind of intuitives um but that um that the obstacle is that we are trained both culturally and educationally to go to thought and that sense whether we believe that i think therefore i am that we feel like we're a thinker we're a doer and i you know and that that development of the highly functioning fast-paced um way of identifying and trying to be safe the the better it gets the more neurotic it gets and the more anxious it gets unless it kind of chooses one role to play and then it just kind of shuts us down either in a kind of depressive or a a role i'm just this way this is just the way i am i just do what i do and that's it or hi i'm just doing what i do you know whatever that is uh that feels like the only option to and then we try to do it with therapy we try to clean up the cloud of our minds and our bodies and then what this is doing is adding this next map or model that has to be experienced and when it's experienced there's usually these protective parts of us that have been so trained to to make us safe that people will shift out into this awareness and then one part will go what are you doing where are you going are you are you you know are you uh, where what about the body what about you know and so you have to learn to use the capacity of this awareness to include those and soothe and uh let those parts of us know that everything's okay and we're actually just going to the kitchen to get some food we'll be right back we're just upgrading the system we're actually going to get what you want which is safety love and optimal living so so it's an, it needs to be a kind of a new you know it's almost like i was just talking with a physicist who was saying that yeah you know up through newtonian physics before quantum physics it just is a it's a whole different model it works fine newtonian physics works fine but there's this deeper subtler layer that is a metaphor for what you know what we're talking about it's another way of uh perceiving that isn't the small self growing up to be the awake self it's actually the awake self's already here so why don't we just glimpse it and then we're going to get pulled back that's kind of the training the training is small glimpses try to function from it type walk talk relate create and then lose it because the habit is so strong but just notice the habit and don't judge yourself or don't judge the judge that shows up that automatically without you even doing it 
but include all that. This awake consciousness and include whatever's happening uh, with a bigger, a bigger sense of being and a bigger capacity. Yeah. So what's, what's coming up for me right now is like, you were saying like, op you're opening up to this experience, you're opening up to this awareness, and then you're moving through your day to day life. And then you kind of contract is it, that's what happens. There's like a contraction and there's a falling off. So what is the experience like when you're actually open? Yeah. How does somebody even know that they're, if, if they're open to this kind of, to yeah. the awake awareness, they're open to it. What is the experience like? Yeah. I mean, uh, you know, we can do a little, a little glimpse or two, let's see, you know, like give people a, a chance to try it. But that's the first thing is you can't, <laughs> the first radical premise is you can't know your true nature or awake awareness or open hearted presence with your mind with will with your small self with imagination with thought with effort with um you know with any parts of your personality so the tuner or what knows is the awareness itself that's already here and uh and interconnected with the thoughts and the feelings and sensations so that awareness has to move itself has to notice it either drops or opens to be aware of space and then aware of mingles with space and awareness so that there's a feeling of what's called big sky mind or pure awareness or uh initially other terms like choiceless awareness or uh open mind open heart but it's literally a feeling that you're not located in your head and not orienting to thought but there's a more feeling of spacious but not just spaced out it's also this subtle uh awareness that's inside and outside so the feeling is almost like the normal feeling is like we're a cloud like we're a solid body of mind and then as we look with mindful witness we say oh we're a cloud that's kind of a process or we're a cloud of sensation but we're still here and we're and and then the key is all right, can the awareness step out to realize we're also the sky? And then resting as the sky, what feels like the sky, what it is scientifically is the thing that gets the logical mind. Well, what do you mean? I know that I have a brain, I've studied biology and neuroscience, and but if you've studied biology and neuroscience, when you do these practices and open to this spacious awareness, which feels like you're no longer orienting to thought, but you're alert and here and clear, and then you can include the cloud. So the cloud of sensations, the awareness is not just outside, it's within, and it's also kind of a rising as the cloud, just as sky, humidity is still invisible, water, cloud are all the same field of awareness, but there's more space. So this um so the you know that's that's part of the role the role of the teacher in this is really like a like a uh, auto mechanic who, who just does a checkup. You know, just like, here's how your car runs, you drive it, tell me what's going on. So, so it's very much about not a guru, but a, uh, a pointer. So that's what these, uh, kind of glimpse descriptions are pointers that allow you to do it for yourself 
and then like an experiment. So here's the hypothesis. There's this awareness that's here. It feels like this, spacious, pervasive, interconnected. Uh, now try this. And then you try. Uh, and then when you feel it, the key is you can't go back to thought for a second opinion. So if you go back to the thinker to check, am I doing it right? Is this really true? That that part of you can't know it, so it will always say, uh, I'm not sure. I don't think so. Maybe, maybe not. But if you feel that you go from thought-based knowing to kind of not knowing, but then there's this not knowing that knows. Kind of like when you ride a bicycle. You're riding a bicycle and I say, well, how do you know you're balancing? You know, if you think about it, you might fall over. But how do you know you're balancing? Well, are you sure you're balancing? I mean, you could logically say, well, I'm not falling over. But how do you know you're, what, is, what does that feel like? What is feel like balancing that is not mental. You're not mentally go left, go right, go right. There's just a and so you get this new knowing that's like a a wisdom mind that trusts and feels um, directly, direct perception. Yeah, so I don't know if this was a mindful glimpse right now, but I was kind of following along what you were saying yeah. and just kind of opening up to the space. Yeah. And and my experience is um, kind of sp it's spacious and uh, boundless. And um, there is there's still a sense, though, of being localized. There's still a sense of somebody's here. It doesn't feel like a heady kind of way, but it's it's kind of just like, the awareness is looking out from here. Uh -huh. I, I know if I start looking for it, I'm not going to be able to find it. But I guess the question is, um, is this all there is to it, right? Just opening up and not being, um, not being stuck in your head, not being stuck in thoughts, kind of seeing that the awareness is inside, it's outside. There's no inside or outside. Right. It's vast, it's boundless. And it's just... Now, this is just the game, just staying in this space and now being able to integrate your life? Or is there something else that goes beyond that? Yeah, I mean, it, it's like a training. It's like a, you know, I I, I kind of say that uh, awakening is the next natural stage of human development. So it's almost like, you know, children are preverbal and then they learn uh, language. And they learn they don't know how to read. If you don't know how to, if you never learn how to read, you can't read. But you have the potential to read. So it's like a developmental stage. You don't know how to operate from, first, you're, you're not using thought. Uh, babies are non-conceptual. They're pre-verbal, so it's not the same. But it it's non-thought-based alive consciousness then we learn uh to uh develop this kind of thought-based ego function we split off into these parts that say you know where we talk to ourselves you know uh you know first we're told don't you know don't touch the hot stove that's hot you know that's hot don't crawl as you're crawling no no and then you were like, ah, we don't know what it is. Ah! And then we either learn by experience to internalize, or we learn by, you know, cross the street only when the green light, cross the street only when the green light. Then we come up to a red light and we start to be this person inside our head says, oh, it's a red light, don't cross the street. And that becomes who we are, is this self-talk, these parts of us that talk, but when you when you go into the next level of functioning, which is kind of a flow consciousness, you've input functioning into your uh, body. You know, they say that you know people who are in the zone or in the flow, 
are not operating from ego, don't have to self-reference, are not referring to thought. So, you know, using examples like people playing uh, an instrument in an orchestra or athletes dribbling down the court, you know, watching their teammates looking one way, throwing another, or just, you know, even when you're just jogging or getting, you know, doing gardening, you get into on 10,000 hours of something. So you operate from this non thought based, uh, joyful consciousness. So my premise is that we've done 10,000 hours of walking, talking, languaging, most work activities. And so if we can intentionally shift into this flow, then we can begin to live an awake way in in whatever we're doing. But we don't necessarily need 10,000 hours of meditation. <laughs> right, because it isn't the 10,000 hours of meditation that is the thing itself, is that it's the, because this is already here, like when I first went to this guy, Toko Ergen, who was giving up. So I had been on, you know, two 21-day retreats, three 10-day retreats, you know, eight five-day retreats and studied, um, went up there. And then he gave this little talk um, for, you know, 10 minutes or so. And then he gave this pointing out instruction. And within three minutes, I felt the same way I did at the end of a 21-day retreat, except I was laughing, my eyes were open, I felt totally alive, not just calm, but alert and clear and kind of connected to everyone and felt like, felt love. And so it, it was more than that. It was at least what I, the calm part uh, and the clarity part were similar, but the embodiment, the joy, connection were more immediately because that consciousness is known. It didn't take me, it wasn't the, the meditation that I did prior to that that made that available because now I've seen that, that people walking off the street have the same experience. There was a a guy <laughs> recently who apparently I found out later he was like on a second date with a with his girlfriend. They're they're still together, so it worked out. Um so he was like she was like, oh well, you know, do you like meditation? Oh, I don't know. I've never done it. It's like, well why don't we before we go to dinner, why don't we go out and why don't we go to this guy who teaches this meditation? So he was sitting in the back with his arms folded in the back and kind of like tapping his foot like okay i'll i'll get through this you know for her and we'll see what happens at the end and then i started to explain flow and and then did these exercises and all of a sudden he's leaning forward and he goes it put his hand just like rose up and he goes what is going on here this i'm a rock climber and this is why i go rock climbing is to feel this the way i feel now except I don't understand how that happened so quickly. So he had no background experience, no hours of doing that particular thing of this glimpsing or meditation. Um, but he did this other thing like people do in their free time. They do these things they love that can take them into something similar. So, yeah, so that doesn't require meditation. In fact, the the first two steps of meditation can be helpful or they can actually be obstacles because let's say so the first classic meditation practice that people learn is one pointed attention so you're focusing from the small self from the focuser to let's say your belly okay uh, let's say your so it's like a flashlight from your head to your belly, and then your mind wanders, and you bring it back, 
and you focus on your belly. And eventually, whether you're doing strong concentration style and you develop the ability to stay with it or you just keep coming back to that attention, what you're doing is you're strengthening the focuser to be the center of who you are. Now, you get symptom benefits, symptom relief of feeling calmer if it works and you do it long enough, but you don't get relief. You get a calmer, small self that eventually it will wear out. So people who do that half an hour later, an hour later, or if even if you do it a day later, two later, three days later, something happens at work, you go, oh, I got to go back on another retreat. But this is, you know, Zen in your pocket. This is the way to, you know, fight it in a moment. So that attentional strengthening, if you focus on your breath from this, and you focus, like if everyone were just to try this, just focus on one point, one area of your belly rising and falling. And notice where you're focusing from, and then notice where you're focusing to. Notice how you can have a small area of focus, but it, that it's very particular. And then just follow that beam of light back up, and then open up where have you been focusing from. So notice that just this simple shift <clears throat> that you were the focuser you were the subject focusing, and now you've shifted location because you're aware of where you were focusing from, as well as you can also be aware of your belly at the same time. You can be aware of both those points of view. And it feels like in order to be aware of the focuser, you have to have shifted to a bigger view to eat, to feel it you can't you're not feeling it from itself just as you don't feel so what's so strange you know is that people feel like oh well i can be aware of distance from here from head to belly but why is it weird that i'm able to focus from field of awareness to what was the focuser because most people can feel that but then they think oh is that imagination or i shouldn't be able to do that because my brain is in my head but so that feeling so when you do that feeling when you shift into this more spacious awareness then even though scientifically you can't say what that is when you measure the brain from this awareness that's equally inside and out, uh, <clears throat> you get amazing brain changes that are reportable and uh, research that I've been involved with as a subject and creating protocols for. Um, and Dan Brown just did a big study recently on <clears throat> advanced meditators, which I helped um, talk to him. I was advisor for him on that, creating that protocol um, of balancing the default mode network and the task mode network so you feel like you're seamlessly connected to everything and you're not, you no longer are mind wandering when you do that. And your brain shows that it has changed this very strong uh, habit. Of, of kind of going to daydream or distraction and then coming back to focus, going to daydream, coming back to focus. Now both internal and external networks are on, but they're appearing to this flow consciousness, which happens with people when they're surfing or other flow consciousness experiences. Yeah, I wanted to ac actually ask you about uh, the several meditation studies you've been a part of. And so what exactly are they finding? Are they finding that um, 
and at least in the studies that you participated in yourself, they finding that the default mode network is there's just less activity. It's shutting down more. What are, what are these studies showing? Yeah, and, it, and and maybe and maybe just for the people that don't know, the default mode network is like the part of our brain that's kind of responsible for our sense of self, like the chattering. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it's interesting because people are just learning what the default mode network is, and and the task mode network. So these are so the simplest way to experientially understand it is. If if you do or have done the attempt to do a task, which is watching your breath at one point, so you put the default or you wait till the task mode network is on, then you can focus for a while, but then your mind will wander. The reason your mind is wandering is not because you're not strong enough or have enough will, it's because your brain is alternating these patterns of external focus, internal focus, task focus, uh, daydream focus. So the default mode generally has this self-referencing quality. It has a daydreaming quality, which creates a little small mini me that is usually trying to be happy, but ends up not being happy is the report. But it also um has some free association it has some part in creativity so a lot you know some psychedelic researchers and meditation researchers are saying well it goes off and it's and and <clears throat> you you don't want it ever to go off because actually the research does show and one research i was in um with at nyu with zoran josipovic um on non-dual awareness, what he calls NDA. Uh, we did these, a uh, group of us did these uh, meditations where we became very concentrated. And what was found is that we did suppress the default mode network. But what that does is it, it creates almost like a comfortably numb feeling. Uh, what one of my teachers Sokni Rinpoche uh, said when he came to the United States, he said, why is everyone doing stupid meditation? <laughs> but I don't call it stupid. I call it sauna meditation. But it, it basically, if you if you concentrate and put the task mode on and shut down the default, you'll kind of be like a robot. You'll be like, hey, everyone, how's it going? But you'll lose the creativity. You'll lose the uh relationality and the kind of bubbling joy you'll be in this kind of calm abiding um so um these this next set we did was to do this uh, meditation where we people did different kind of advanced mahamudra embodiment meditations where you open to the space and then you realize the space is outside and within it's equally in front and within and behind and around and above and then you're you start to be aware from the field of awareness that's inside and out that awareness is inside now that movement is inside now but you're not aware from here you're aware from everywhere and nowhere and here which is here and so you're aware of you know kind of a movement of your brain that goes toward default mode and you're aware of your brain going toward task mode but you're not your brain your brain is like your hand having sensations and so you're so they kind of start to balance um and it shows that the default mode and task mode balance and the feeling is this kind of seamlessness it's like a calmness that's interconnected and you kind of know how you feel and you know what you're looking at it's like playing sports or or doing something like that playing music or you know being in this kind of ease or some people find it when they're driving they go for a sunday drive because they actually feel like they can be doing a task and not overthinking so yeah so that was one one experiment that i think 
showed that it's kind of open-eyed, optimally functioning potential of this awake flow consciousness. Yeah, this is this is making me think about. I just the other. I think it was yesterday. I saw somebody post posted on Facebook like, "I'm happy that I didn't meditate myself stupid." And then mm-hmm. there was a bunch of people commenting on it, and I was reading the comments. But but I and I think that's what essentially he was saying is that he this person that made this post, he was saying that he knew a lot of people that just kind of did this kind of very rigid kind of meditation, just very focusing, and he felt like they were their experience was somehow being diminished like they were somehow not opening to their emotions and to creativity and to other aspects of life and it sounds like that's what you're saying that there is a you know a way of maybe meditating or certain practices that kind of diminish the creativity and just put you in this kind of blissed out state but you're not open to anything else but with effortless mindfulness or like the mahamudra practice we're we're trying to include everything. We're trying to include the creativity and all of this experience from this calm space. That's right. Yeah, and uh, you know the you know to say the positive thing about it is traditionally in all of the practices from even in uh, Theravada insight meditation and certainly in Mahamudra and Vajrayana, which is Tibetan style <clears throat> calm abiding that what you're doing it, it's a preliminary practice but the key is it's just the first stage it's not the whole thing and that's the that's the concern so you're you're soothing the animal you're calming your body and mind because if it is scared and agitated if you're in a fight or flight mode sympathetic nervous system is on and your mind is agitated it's hard to to do any any practices, whether it's effortless, mindfulness, or mindfulness. So some sense of calming, one practice is watching a breath. Another is doing kind of yogic breath breath practices, which I actually find better, uh, simpler, doesn't take so long, and more people can do it, uh, calming the body and mind, calming the nervous system. Then um, either going to insight next, until you deconstruct it, which is where what um, the Pasana Insight Meditation does, or go right to not just the mindful witness, but to the awake consciousness, which then immediately has the insight. Oh, that that small self is a part of me; doesn't need to be gotten rid of. It's not an illusion, as many people say. It's not. It, it, it's 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 a it's a pattern that forms that still can be functional because the memory system is helpful to remember my phone number and where i where i live and it can form and have uh functional patterns that remember oh yeah this is the way you do that right you do this and you do that oh yeah and then uh you make you cook when you're cooking this dish you want to put the heat on low and you want to you know and that part of us is not just you know, could be called mind states, or, but it it tends to be the what the role of me was is this manager or this function, so that you can you can allow that to just be part of the identity. But now the key is the the nature of mind or the ground of being is felt and functional as not as requires a few more stages of and you know a map and a tuner to be able to access this um this natural capacity and if you just keep doing the first preliminary practice it's not likely to get you there which is in those preliminary in that tradition, it's a monastic, traditionally a monastic tradition. So you start with that, but you then you join the monastery and you do that eight, 12 hours a day. And, you know, then you move on through that system. So this is a system that is designed for householders. And there was a tradition that in the history in northern India, not even Tibet. So this is a North Indian tradition, not a Tibetan tradition. Tibetans took it up. They 
gratefully preserved a lot of it, but it's um, there was a period of time that's been written about where whole areas of North India were all awakening, you know, everyday people, householders, fishmongers, uh, merchants, and they would all just teach each other. Hey, check this out. What's this? Watch this. You know, what is, you just try this? Oh, I'm really upset about this. Okay, well, recognize it and then try that, you know. Uh, so that that would be the hope for for how this could could be passed on. It's not not as to make it um the map and the methods um available so people can do it by themselves and teach each other rather than have to have a class of monks or teachers or gurus but to have, this, have a, a democratic uh, and then people can check check it out with each other and check it out with books and just to make sure they don't go off on some tangents um so first things I'm doing and working on is creating an app, uh, wellness and meditation, non-dual meditation app that will have all these different practices and some talks that people can just have it in and do it on their own. And then they can actually record their own voice doing, doing it to themselves. And then eventually you learn it. So you don't need a, another voice. You just remember to unhook and drop and open and rest and include yeah so <laughs> that when you were talking right before you said uh m making it enlightenment like democratized like that that's the exact thought that i was getting and um regarding the app you already have the app or you're working on the app yeah the app will be out september 2023 very cool. So that's coming up. What's is going to be effortless mindfulness? Is that what is it, it's going to be called? It's going to be called um, mindful glimpses. Very cool. Very cool. And so I think you've already, you know, gave us a couple of glimpses, glimpses, mm -hmm. a couple of pointers. But maybe we can you can guide us through another one now, just so the listeners are kind of uh, focus on in right now on on doing this mindful glimpse. And I, in particular, I I find that there's something you mentioned a lot, and it's this unhooking. Mm -hmm. awareness local awareness so maybe yeah. you can include that in in the mindful glimpse yeah let's let's do let's do two, two short ones this first one is kind of a one that um often works without even knowing how to unhook just needs and it's similar to the first one that helped me that you and helps people who don't even need a background so the premise is just the simple premise that you can experience that the way our consciousness came from being dependent and non non thought based, so that we were being taken care of by adults, so that we didn't uh, hurt ourselves, and then we developed this internal uh, problem solving uh, safety uh, mechanism in our head, and it feels like it's located in thought and in our mind, but that's just a function. What if that wasn't the only location what if <clears throat> that contracted <clears throat> identity was taken over had taken over all of our sense of self and it could just relax into a more open awareness-based way of knowing so the premise is that i'm going to just ask this simple inquiry um, that you can understand with your mind, with thought, and then let awareness unhook from thought and look to the space or the background or to open awareness. So the answer to the inquiry is not in thought. It's not to think about it. It's to set up a movement of letting this problem solver relax and feel into the background or the space that is here when that other chattering, fast moving, scanning for danger part is relaxes and opens more space. Yeah. So this is the simple inquiry. 
that goes, and there's a little bit of a series of questions that I'm asking to your awareness eventually. So here it is. So what's here now when there's no problem to solve? So just understand the words. The problem solver will understand the words. And then see what it's like if the problem solver can relax and awareness can feel what remains in that space. So what's this that's here just now? When there's no problem to solve. You don't look to thought. You let thought become like mental sensations. And you just feel into the awareness that's spacious and pervasive. non-thought-based alert awareness. What's its qualities? And what's it like to rest as this awareness space that's connected to your body, it's not leaving, it's just here, simple, clear, and awake. And then what's it like to be aware from this awareness that's arising as vibration, sensation, thoughts, feelings, your body, and the room. So you remain with this background awareness that's spacious and pervasive, but now it includes like an ocean of awareness arising as your body and everything in the room but mostly space, energy, and objects. So letting physical sensations arise and letting mental sensations, just like chatter of at a restaurant at when other tables are talking, just uninterested, you don't have to look to thought or use thought in order to be alert. What's this like? Yeah, I, I think for me, just as soon as you you said, let go, what is it like when there's no problem to solve what's here? It's just, I started to feel just a lot, a sense of joy, a mm -hmm. sense of ease and joy and, and openness and I just like there was a smile on my face mm -hmm. automatically. Um, so I, I hope li those that are listening that they can at least get a taste of that kind of opening and that kind of freedom that is here right now. When we just relax, the, the manager, the problem solver. Is there another one that you wanted to do? Sure. Bob? sure. Yeah. And just to say that, um, yeah, you can go back and listen to this again. And, you know, you could stop just at that first inquiry. I kind of layered the pointers, uh, but it might have been too much for some. It may have been helpful. So others, it might, it might just, like Artem said, just the first what's here now and there's no problem to solve is enough in itself. And then to say, make sure you understand that this is not uh, to avoid problems or to get beyond problems, this is actually to upgrade the problem solver. This is that the problem solver is the problem uh, that makes us worried and frustrated and anxious and self-judging. That when we upgrade, we let that small problem solver, which is made of the contracted self-referencing identity that is a developmental uh, potential to go beyond, when that relaxes and we upgrade to this awareness-based that can even 
thank the problem solver for all its hard work, which is really a powerful kind of psychological work that I include uh, from internal family systems and compassionate inquiry and Gabor Mate and Richard Schwartz, uh, Bessel van der Koot. So that kind of work with trauma and with thanking these parts rather than getting rid of them or spiritually zapping them away so that you can then deal with issues or situations from an easier way. So, yeah, so so that, that one kind of opens you up. This one, we're going to drop down from head space to full embodiment or heart space, yeah? So <clears throat> some people, it's easier to go out and then come in like we did. Others, it's easier to go in and then open up and come back. So this one starts to <clears throat> kind of immediately ask you to feel the radical premise, which is that awake consciousness is already here, and that actually when I am going to ask you to be aware of the awareness that's identified with thought and creating a thinker, and then ask the awareness of awareness to decenter and relocate so that the awareness is aware of your jaw from your jaw, and then the awareness moves itself. So the doer, the thinker, the self is not moving, it's your awake consciousness that moves itself, so that you feel your throat from within your throat, drop and feel your body from within your body, so that you aren't looking down to your body, and you're not checking up to make sure you're doing it right, but you start to feel direct perception from the field of awareness that's all around and also locally able to be aware from within. <clears throat> and then that center goes to this kind of heart space that most of us around the world say, well, this is me. And there's some kind of, so it's not the emotional heart, which can be in the throat. It's not the physical heart. It's not a heart chakra. It's not the belly brain, but it touches all those. It's kind of a a center, centerless center, a space that seems like when you feel you're more there, it opens you up into this kind of open-hearted awareness, open mind first, and then open-hearted wisdom. So we'll try that. So oh, you can do it eyes open or closed. Um, <clears throat> the first thing is to feel where are you listening to me from? So who is listening and where is the listener? So find that local constellation of consciousness that organizes from your senses and then just feel that awareness is identified or attached to that center and then somehow awareness can simply unhook and open to space. And so immediately there, immediately here, notice the quiet. And then feel like that awareness, like a bubble, and then drop within. So the awareness moves to your jaw your smile, and then the awareness moves itself down, dropping, knowing your throat and your neck directly from within, feeling the effervescent aliveness, the space, the awareness from within. Just see if you can feel this direct perception so that subject and object are located in the same Area, So you're not looking up to thought check and you're not stretching attention down or looking that you feel like the center of who you are is in your throat and then drops below your neck into your upper body. So you feel embodied from within your body. 
So just feel what that's like to feel that aliveness, the contraction and expansion, heat and cold directly from within. And then let your awareness kind of go behind and below your emotional heart and find this heart space, this heart mind, and just rest in this open area that's equally within and not only in front, but in the middle of your body. Feel that awareness at the subtlest level. So it goes from kind of a living stream of awareness into this awake space that's equally inside in the middle of you and even toward the back and opens up behind you so that bubble can open up through the subtlest dimension until it moves at the speed of awareness and discovers the awareness that has your back. So finding that awake consciousness that's like an ocean of awareness behind you that it then flows into your body like a wave <clears throat> and feel like you're looking out of the eyes of your heart, interconnected with everything. <clears throat> so you're dropped, now open in front and back, the sides above and below, all around. Spacious, interconnected feeling. And just feel this sense of being fully embodied and interconnected, interbeing, it's what Thich Nhat Hanh called it. So your eyes and your ears and the information in the office of your head can kind of come down by Wi-Fi to this more center of your body, which is really more the center, that has more space, more heart, more compassion, more wisdom, less chatter. And just remain at home in your heart and receive that information from your feet and your brain. And just notice what it's like so that all your senses, equal rights to all senses, are on. And then as your ears receive and come down, and then as your eyes gently open, let them be receptive. You feel like they're like a periscope coming down to your heart space or your heart mind. So your body is receiving this kind of shift in your nervous system and your clarity and perception have shifted as well. So what do you notice from here? What's the view? What's the felt sense of identity or being? And then the question curiously is, is this a meditation state or is this more your natural condition? to which other states can come and go, and that we've been living in an altered state, and this is really the more awake, open-minded, open-hearted sense of potential to live and respond. Yeah, I, I think what's, you know, been coming up for me a lot in, in my own practice and this coming up right now is, you know, you know, I've heard this said many times how like this is so simple, like you can't believe it. It's mm -hmm. so simple. And and that's what I'm starting to recognize. Like, I think that some of the barriers for me been like comparing or having an idea of what the experience should be like. Mm -hmm. And then when all of that falls away and it's just it's so simple, it's so clear. Mm -hmm. Um it's not like something special. It's not like a special state. Um, and we can taste it now. And yeah, I don't, it's been a while since I've, it's interesting because doing this podcast right now, it's like, we're doing a podcast and I have this whole interview and all this, you know, this thread I want to follow and all the, you know, but then there's just a sense 
in, in doing that three minute glimpse, there's just a sense of uh, vastness, openness, freedom. There's no problem. There's no anxiety. There's no stress. Mm -hmm. um, and and I, I just hope that the listeners can also get a taste of that. Yeah. Yeah. Beautiful. Thank you. Um, yeah. It's a, it's amazing. It, you know, it takes a little, because it's new, everyone, you know, takes a little time. And even if you get the first one, sometimes the the ego defenses can defend against the second time or the third time, and you have to kind of stay with it and learn how to soften and, you know, be willing to try different doorways too. I have a whole different uh, way of creating uh, different glimpses for different learning styles, more, you know, physical, more mental types, more emotional, more intuitive uh, doorways that um some people can get one glimpse and can't get another and that's fine they're all kind of not you don't have to get them all so you know there's you know certainly available stuff for you to try different glimpses um on yeah you can go go try them on on youtube or on my website or eventually there'll be a an app to to try them yeah, soon soon you'll be able to have Lock Kelly in your pocket yep. and you could just whip out the, the app and just get a little glimpse right in the in the middle of your stressful and hectic day and just connect to that uh, piece that's always there underneath all that mm -hmm. uh, craziness. So so here's another here's a question that I, I wanted to ask you, and it's it's interesting kind of asking this question now because Right now, my experience is kind of just free. I don't feel any problems. Um, I feel a lot of joy being here with you right now. Um, but, you know, in my own life, sometimes when I'm dealing with stress, like a question comes up, it's like, I'm not sure, um, you, you know, stress and like the, the sense of suffering comes up and, and I'm not sure, do I need to do more therapy and work through some internal conflicts or, do I simply do more meditation and, you know, recognize a deeper level of emptiness? And, you know, you've, you've mentioned, you know, you're a psychotherapist, you've mentioned working with parts with, you know, internal family systems. This is something I've been kind of diving uh, into a lot of <laughs> actually have this book right here, self therapy by Jay early. Uh, but what is the relationship between meditation and therapy, how do these modalities work together and how does somebody know like wh what they need? Do I need more therapy? Do I need more meditation? Do I need both? How do you think about this? Yeah, um, I would say that most people need both. <laughs> so, and certain kinds of therapy and certain kinds of meditation are better for different people. I certainly have investigated most of them that are currently available and you know, find that for me and others who are like me, meaning that they they like what I like, and they're uh, that this combination of um, what are parts based therapy and direct practice um, effortless mindfulness works really well together, and one or the other is missing something. Um, so, so the it it seems like the uh, you know the people who are coming from therapy often will just you know soothe their ego and you know clear some trauma and emotional life and no and similarly, but a different path. Those who are just doing preliminary practices or even kind of too too much pure awareness practice like um i am the awareness and there is no self and i've gone beyond all self but my partner thinks i'm spaced out what do you think i think you're spaced out your partner's right yes because you can go to this kind of almost pure awareness disembodied <clears throat> sense of no self or analyzing all that away but it's it's almost like the what you're doing there is you're using this kind of 
different lenses of reality along this continuum. And it's important to have kind of the multi-dimensional higher and lower uh, dimensions because from the pure awareness on this side to the <clears throat> energetic practices here to the seeing of the deconstruction, oh, it's only thoughts, feelings, sensations, there's no solid self <clears throat> to doing these, you know, kind of focused calming practices or then starting to do mindfulness-based cognitive therapy here and then now you're doing more body-based practices and then you're doing trauma work here but only doing trauma work that doesn't have a spiritual or a consciousness opponent and then <clears throat> the 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 middle area i think is um is recognizing that thoughts feelings and, and sensations pattern into what feels like identities or me <clears throat> so it's not just that we have one ego that we got to get rid of or make peace with but that there's you know a strong managing part but then everyone knows immediately that there's this self talk between whether you call it personas or parts or sub personalities there's a long history of this from back to jung carl jung who called it personas and gestalt therapy that would take uh parts of you and have them sit out in a chair and you dialogue with them out externally and then uh you know different different systems but the sense that the identities are functional parts that they've been trying very hard to be me and be safe don't need to be dissected away by meditation um but they ne need to realize that they are energy at one level but as soon as they pattern into a functional feeling of going to work relating to somebody there's a relationship from true nature to that part that those parts need to be part of a team um that you can't go without parts <laughs> that i'm talking to you now then i'll talk to my wife then i'll talk to a friend then i'll you know uh do you know i'll i'll then i'll type and i'll be in a different part of me so um there are traumatic parts that got formed early um certainly everyone knows the shame based part the sense that feels worthless or not good enough that felt early on by even just developmentally developmental trauma or small t trauma it's called everyone has this it's part of growing up and moving from dependent to independent where you get as you get trained like you know that that you know don't touch the stove no you know bad no don't touch stove bad and then the feeling is that the action isn't bad but i'm bad something wrong with me i you know i'm internalized identity shame is internalizing and identifying with that feeling and then certainly people who have had more extreme big trauma or complex trauma who have been abused or abandoned or you know have this these emotions that form into world views and the only capacity to deal with them um is to have a bigger capacity of who you are so that's where they come together so i've seen and tried to do psychological work without um kind of awake consciousness and you get only so far so you can only grow up to a certain level until you have to wake up in order to continue to grow up now you can grow up and then wake up and then spiritually bypass which a lot of you know spiritual teachers and gurus have done and what happens is they have an initial awakening and then they go to this kind of what i've found is almost like adolescent developmental stage of like oh i'm free everything's relative and there's no problems and there's no problem to solve and everything's good so i'll just do what i want and then they start 
you know, with money and sex and power, they let this almost adolescent, you know, narcissist, primary narcissism come out without looking at that as a part um, of them. So, so that's the danger of that spiritual bypass of initial awakening. That's why initial awakening has to lead to coming back to embodiment, humility, uh, interconnection, same, same, de- you know, democratization of the of the realization that nobody's different, nobody's special, everyone, but everyone's awake. Everyone's awake, precious being. And so those start to work together so you can start to heal what everyone has, um, personal trauma, social trauma, generational trauma. It's basically just misunderstandings that have happened that bind in our consciousness, in our body. Uh, you know, in Buddhism, they call it uh, storehouse consciousness, um, alaya vijnana. Uh, so that uh, this has to be then, so rather than doing it like the traditional direct path is renunciation. If you start with renunciation of uh, the more Theravada, you become a monk, you renounce family, sex, work, uh, anything pleasurable, and you do a renounce. And then second stage is liberation. So now you start to deal with your emotions and you try to transform negative into positive. The five poisons are transferred into the five wisdoms. And then the third stage is direct or uh, realization practice. You realize who you are. And then, uh, so 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 I think the better way to do it is is direct. So go to realization and then you can immediately things as you said will get will be clear things will be cleared immediately and you'll then have the capacity to do liberation and you won't have to do the what needs to be renounced will be clear because not everything needs to be renounced there's still work and sex and uh family life and other things that don't need to be renounced it's it's not within those things those are the more difficult things the uh, relationship and uh, you know that, that that have to then stronger drives food, sex, uh, and comfort. You know things like that. So uh, those become because you've found the freedom and the joy that's beyond joy. You don't need you don't need to get caught in kind of more addictive cycle of craving and aversion. So so that's that's one way to look at the way those two come together. Yeah, that was a beautiful explanation. And I mean, that path resonates for me in my own life. I want to check real quick. Do I have time to just ask one more question? Yeah. just want to be respectful of your time. Um, So, you know, and this is kind of related to everything that you're saying. And, um, you know, people, people have a way of thinking about like the Buddhist path and emptiness in particular and how it's kind of like this nihilistic kind of disappearing. Uh, there is no self, there's nobody here. And I see a lot of stuff on, um, on YouTube. There's a lot of this, what I call it radical non-duality. And it's just like, Oh, there's nobody here. You don't exist. There's nothing here. Um, and it's like, it, yeah, yeah. In some sense, it, it, that makes sense from maybe from an ultimate perspective, yeah. but it, it seems like it's very unhelpful for, for people that you know are maybe new to the path. And there's all this stuff spreading, and every everybody's now a teacher and spreading this stuff. And they might even have genuine realization to, to some degree, but it's not it's not like well formulated. It's not stable, and it's mm-hmm. not necessarily embodied. So, I'm just curious if you can. Uh, explain how you understand emptiness yeah. and how you know the the buddhist path and emptiness is is not really about nihilism it's not yeah. nihilism yeah beautiful yeah yeah so yeah uh talking about emptiness and non-duality is important to clarify different yeah and i've i've had you know similar experiences just as we were talking initially about people who can get caught in the initial <clears throat> stage of initial practices of uh you know one point of attention and go into that sauna or meditation or 
comfortably numb. <clears throat> Once you do the initial waking up from the small self, you realize, oh, it's just thought, there's nothing there. And the map you have then says the goal is no self, you know, that, uh, you know, in those three, uh, dukkha, suffering, anicca is change, everything's changing, and anatta is no self. And it's as if, okay, well, I see what suffering is, is being a self. I see everything's changing, and now no self. So there's no self. And then I'm done. And But it literally is is just the, the early next stage. It's, oh, I'm a small self. Oh, it's not a small self. It's, it's a change in content. There isn't a solid self. Oh, there's not knowing. There's that's not me. There's 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 centerlessness. There's just no thing, and that is the not knowing. But then, if you stop there, you have to create an intellectual version of that, where you start getting very very upset about people are like there is no self. Don't you understand? You got to understand. Don't say there's a self. Or there's no self. You know, who's saying that? There's not, what do you mean? It's just being said. There's just word, you know. So it becomes like, okay, okay. There's like I go to the I go to the grocery store and things end up in my cart. There's no chooser. There's no doer anymore. Really? Okay, that's really interesting. Now what ends up in your cart? Is it things that are random that you don't like to eat or a lot of cat food and you don't even have a cat? No. It's, it's so how did those end up in there? And who's doing that? That's anyhow. So <laughs> It it seems to be uh, that in this kind of Mahamudra structure, which is why I like more Mahamudra style than even Dzogchen style, but even in Dzogchen, non-duality means ultimate reality is there is this pure awareness, no contents, timeless, boundless, empty, no thing, is none other human being, energy, things, and people. And they're not two. So the Buddhist non-duality is the ultimate and the relative are not two. It's also sometimes called the two truths. Um, whereas some of the more Neo-Advaita and others, they're calling ultimate reality or pure awareness non-dual, but it's actually just not dualistic. This is dualistic. That's not dualistic, but it's not non-dual because it's only it's a new dualism. Because the, the metaphor they use is I am the awareness, everything else is illusion, or everything else is coming and going. It's not real, only awareness is real. It's like a movie screen. I'm the movie screen of awareness, everything else is the movie. So so then that to me sounds like two. I don't know. I don't know. That's not to. The not to is is what in Mahmudra is called. You go from everyday mind, the subtle body, subtle mind, which is mindfulness, to awake awareness, which is Dharmakaya, pure awareness, same thing that they're talking about in more uh you know that uh, type of Pure awareness, non-duality. Uh, then the next one's called simultaneous mind or same taste or one taste. One taste, same taste is the big move that most, it's not even on the map of a lot of people. So same taste means that that pure awareness that's aware of itself by itself as itself when it looks, it's it's not a movie screen with everything coming and going. It's more of an ocean and wave. The energy is arriving, rising made of awareness. And the pattern of sensation and thought is, is not other than awareness. It's a wave made of the ocean of awareness so that there's this um, non-duality. There's they're not two two things going on. The the 
the primary dimension is the awareness, but it expresses itself as emptiness and appearance. Emptiness and appearance are not two. Um, so, and then, so the key then becomes also two, two, two types of emptiness. Emptiness is used in two ways. It's used to be e empty of, meaning void, or not a thing like an empty cup. But that's really a kind of a Western, there's a stage where you could say, okay, it's empty, or you could say, but you wouldn't even use emptiness to say contentless, boundless awareness. You would just say pure, or you would say, because emptiness is defined um, in Theravada, let alone in Mahayana and Dzogchen Mahamudra, as um, empty of a separate thing. So there's not there's not a self, but that doesn't mean there's nothing there. It's empty of being independent. There's no independent tree because a tree is not a tree without water, sun, and earth. So it's empty of being separate, not empty of existence. So interdependent means interconnected. So emptiness is interconnection. So emptiness is the the non separate thingness of of which means everything's dancing emptiness means that it is uh it is ultimate and relative are not two and it forms into patterns of things but those things are are intermediate so there's in buddhism there's dharmakaya which is pure awareness then there's sub, some bogakaya, which is the energetic, imagistic, uh, dreamlike quality. And then there's nirmanakaya, which is relative reality. And in that case, they're not three. There's, there's three dimensions, but they're, they're all... So they don't use unity or oneness, but they're, they're trying to say, yeah, there's the foundation of... It's arising as... That's something that appears differently, but appearance is not different. And then the fifth stage after pure awareness and then simultaneous mind, which means simultaneously awareness and relative reality, then there is bodhicitta, which is um, heart mind or compassionate activity or the feeling of love, the feeling that the fabric is basic goodness and um, all, all at onceness. Yeah, that that's a completely different description of emptiness than uh, you know the nihilistic, cold, bleak mm -hmm. uh, one that some people think uh, emptiness refers to. And then you mentioned this earlier with Tet Nan Han, like yeah. this idea of interbeing, and to me that that it really speaks to it. It's like there's the aspect of the ocean and the waves and, and there's the stillness and the liveliness and it's it's all the same thing and it's no thing. <laughs> um, yeah. It's so not yeah. Just stillness, not just stillness. They say in, in Mahamudra, one of the classic things is everything's made of stillness, movement, and awareness. So it's not, you know, even some, it's like, well, it's trying, you're trying to get still or silent, you know, but that's just half of it. There's also movement. And then, the source is awareness. Yes, yeah, beautiful formulation. And um, yeah, I'm just really grateful for this, these teachings, really grateful for what you're sharing. And I'm really happy that I came across uh, uh, Dan Brown's lineage and, and been working with my teacher there, Dustin. Really appreciate him. And uh, Michael Taft's, a lot of his stuff has been really similar to this. And I just, I just feel like you know, I've been meditating for a while and I feel like this stuff is working a lot better for me than whatever I was doing before. And it kind of took a while for me to fi find this and, and work with this. But I'm hoping that um, others can come across this maybe sooner and, and realize that uh, in a lot of ways, meditation could be a lot more simple mm -hmm. yes. and um, it's a lot more accessible and you don't have to 
yeah. you don't have you don't have to be a monk. You don't have to go and on these crazy long retreats. Okay. You can get a taste of um, peace and liberation right now. Yeah, and maybe I'll say one more thing, just because a lot of people these days are. I'll do a short thing on psychedelics, just because. Oh I, yeah, that's. That, please do because that, I don't, don't want to go. I, don't, I won't go into the full full thing, but just to say that people are looking for this in psychedelics, but sometimes they have. It, it's not good for some people. Forty percent people have a negative experience. Uh, certainly, twenty percent have an amazing experience. And others have good experience, but the middle period of people often it's about the content or the everything is again, it's almost like it shows them that things aren't real and there's some kind of bliss states and there's and then they get everything's connected, but they don't necessarily get that it's who I am. And they don't know how to continue it without taking any more hallucinogens in their everyday life. So this, you know, these kind of direct practices go to the beneficial parts of what you get with, you know, certainly mushrooms and, um, uh, you know, some LSD and some, uh, you know, ketamine. Uh, you 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 have these parts of you that arise. Emotions are more available, but then when it's pointed out who it's appearing to. All of a sudden, you have a capacity to, um, to, to do it to to access everything without the trails. You know, you don't get the, you don't get the, the physical, which is good, and because you want to drive and you want to walk and work, but you get the feeling of interdependence, interconnection, a sense of this other kind of freedom and bliss and joy that's safer and it's. Um, it can be done uh, to continue what people were looking for in a kind of cathartic uh, psychedelic experience. Yeah, I love that you brought this up. And because for me, actually, psychedelics have been a big part of my journey. And they kind of that's what brought me and got me more into meditation. But I, I do think some of the things you're saying are relevant. And this is something I've started to realize more recently. And you know, in particular, I had really powerful experiences using uh, this one substance, uh, 5-MeO-DMT. And, you know, I spoke, <laughs> this it somehow comes up in like a lot of podcast episodes, but but that, you know, these were really like these kind of ego dissolving experiences and, 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 and this like sense of non-duality. And what I've realized, and Dan used to say this, um, you know, before he passed away, like I've heard him say this on during one of his retreats, that you can get attached to that experience. Yeah. And I think that as much as I tried not to get attached in the back of my mind, there would always be like, am I there right now? Am I there? Am, oh, like, is this the non-dual experience? Wait, this is not how it was. Like I would compare. And I think only recently that I learned to kind of let go of the comparing and, and the, the whole experience thing, like ha having to get back to that experience. Yeah. So as, as powerful, you know, I'm grateful for all those experiences. I'm grateful for the medicines. I think there's mm -hmm. immense potential, not, not just for getting people into meditation, but an awakening, but actually moving through trauma and like working through trauma. Like I've seen that happen for me and um, there's a lot of benefits to it, but yeah. at the same time, it's, there are there can be downfalls and there can be uh, things that actually uh, are become barriers. And I've seen that for myself. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And that, you know, how to continue it, no matter how good an experience you have. How do you find that, you know, what you said you were experiencing after three minute glimpse just, you know, half an hour ago, that that, you know, that can be the baseline that takes you from whatever stress or anxiety is now your life after psychedelics, you know, besides the memory of it and, and take you into uh, a baseline, a new baseline of daily living. Yeah. Lock. Um, this is, you know, this is my, um, I think this is my 30th episode and I, I, genuinely think this has been one of the most enjoyable interviews i've done uh just being with you i just feel a great sense of openness and and peace and joy 
And I'm grateful for all your teachings. I'm grateful for for this path. And mm -hmm. just wanted to ask, um, you know, is there anything else that you wish I would ask you? Or is there anything else you want to say before we wrap up? I think, yeah, I think, you, you know, I've been on some more than 30 podcasts, but this is one of the best ones too, because I think you set up, you knew, you knew having come from a similar tradition and just where you are, you know, to ask the central questions and hopefully people will be curious even if they don't understand all the terms and things i just hope that you can't know by reading books and uh you know just thinking about it but hopefully this will be inspiring to taste um to try different tastes of this these short glimpses and uh see which ones are useful to you. So thank you very much, Artem. Thanks so much, Locke. Appreciate you. All, right. All the best. Good luck.